Welcome to Homework Help for High Schoolers, presented by Evo Libre Consulting. My name is Jan Johnston Tyler, and I'm the founder and CEO of Evo Libre, as well as the author of The Mom's Guide to Asperger Syndrome and the CEO of Self, an executive functioning workbook. Evo Libre Consulting is located in Silicon Valley, California, and we provide services for students ages 14 through adult who may have a mild disabilities such as ADHD, a learning disability, Asperger syndrome, or high functioning autism, as well as may have a mood disorder such as anxiety or depression. So here we are at the end of July, getting into August, and we're thinking about getting back to school. And transitioning back into school means return to routine, getting up earlier, getting organized, getting on top of assignments, and getting fun back into life. All of these things are important to getting our kids to, at their peak performance and all of our kids need structure, but it also gets them out of their comfort zone. They've had lots of free time to sleep in, to play, lack of stress, and here we go, getting back into it. So some of the keys to success are first and foremost, getting the engine back at the optimal performance level. What do we mean by that? Well, we're gonna look at sleep hygiene, diet, de-stressing with exercise, and de-stressing with fun and downtime. Those are really key and important to put in place before we can even talk about organization. So let's talk about sleep hygiene. Sleep hygiene is very key for pretty much every high school student, but certainly for those who have an additional challenge. We know through studies that teens need about nine hours of sleep, and this is up through the age of 22 to 25. Yet most of this uh, adolescent population is only getting six to seven hours of sleep. This deficit in sleep over time can increase depression, anxiety, attention deficit, mood and behavior issues, and those are on top of the original diagnosis, whatever it may be. So it really makes everything worse. The important thing here is not to harp on what time to go to bed because that's a losing battle. Instead, focus on making sure that your student gets up at the same time each day, five days a week, so Monday through Friday. And if at all possible, don't allow them to sleep longer than two extra hours on the weekends. And if necessary, unplug your kid at midnight. So a couple other things to remember. Adolescents by nature are nocturnal. This is normal, it's biologic, it's how they're wired, and you cannot change it. It is really impossible to try to make a kid fall asleep, so I don't recommend trying. We do have some larks, who, people who by nature just wake up more early, so therefore they can fall asleep a little earlier. But most adolescents, if left to their own devices, would fall asleep 1, 2, or 3 a.m. and sleep until maybe between 9 and noon. So in order to help make up this deficit, it's perfectly fine to allow naps. Naps in the afternoon really can refresh a kid. They can help catch up on the sleep deficit and help them get through the homework that's facing them. But remember, nap should never be longer than 60 to 90 minutes, which is about the length of a REM cycle. Otherwise, they're going to have difficulty falling asleep that night or they're gonna wake up groggy. Additionally, kids who have racing brain or intrusive thoughts may need to listen to something as they're falling asleep. This gently engages the language center of the brain to keep those intrusive thoughts at bay. They can listen to an audiobook, they can listen to music, they can listen to NPR, something like that. Anything that engages that language center so they are not constantly thinking, thinking, thinking. The other thing to remember is to turn down the brightness on all electronic devices. We know that blue light interrupts the circadian rhythm. So to the extent possible, make sure you turn down the brightness on laptops, cell phones, iPads, etc., and so forth. The other thing is if your kid's playing games at night, which it may not be a great idea, but if they are playing games, make sure the games are things that are pattern matching or problem solving games and to stay away from really hyper games late in the evening. So games like Bejeweled, Sudoku, Scramble, that type of thing are fine. And as is reading, of course, reading books is oftentimes a good way to go to sleep. About getting up, five days a week, remember, we want the student to get up at the same time. 
This helps set the circadian rhythm, which helps them then fall asleep a little bit earlier. If you have a heavy sleeper, a kid who does not easily rouse in the morning, then you can try the multiple alarm clock method if necessary. We usually use two, sometimes three alarm clocks to help kids learn how to wake up more naturally, come out of sleep, their last REM cycle, and come to arousal state. So the first alarm is by the bed and we want it to be something pleasant, a radio station, music, whatever they find uh, not too offensive. We want that alarm to be set 30 minutes before the final get up time. So if 7.30 is the time they absolutely have to be up, set this alarm for 7 a.m. The second alarm should be loud and a little bit more obnoxious, a beep, beep, beep or something like that. And we want that alarm set 15 minutes before the final get up time. So again, in our instance here, 7.30 is the last time to get up. We want this set for 7.15 in the morning. The third alarm is very loud and very obnoxious, preferably one of those mechanical bell type alarms would be ideal. And this should be across the room and it should be set for, in our instance here, 7.30 a.m. Over time, you'll be able to eliminate first alarm three and then alarm two so that the child is learning how to wake up naturally with alarm one. It does take time, however, it, and it needs to be consistent day after day to make sure that all three alarms are set, but over time, they really will learn how to get up on the first alarm. So once we've got them up and moving, we got to feed them. We all know that breakfast is the most important meal of the day, yet oftentimes kids skip on this primarily because they're in such a rush to get out the door that they haven't woken up enough or they haven't been awake long enough for the gastric juices to start flowing, which then signals to the brain that they're hungry. So if we can get them up a little bit earlier, they'll actually be hungry. We can get them some food before they walk out the door. The most important thing here to remember is protein. It's really absolutely a necessity. Eggs, yogurt, cheese, tofu, bacon, sausage, even a Big Mac is probably a better idea than a bagel simply because even though it has lots of fat and salt, it also has a fair amount of protein. That protein is really necessary to sustain the brain's ability to stay focused and alert through the morning hours until lunch. Without that, most kids are gonna crash about 10, 30, or 11 and lose a big chunk of their day as they try to stay awake the rest of the day. Fruit can give a quick energy surge and there's nothing wrong with that as well. Uh, I like to make sure that families give their kids protein snacks of some sort to keep in their backpack. These could be little bags of nuts, they can be power bars. Anything that is quick to consume and carries a fair amount of protein is fine. Again, we wanna stay away from too much sugar throughout the day. And carbs should be used earlier in the day sparingly if at all. They make us sleepy. It's not a great idea to have a carb-laden breakfast. The kids tend to feel logy and, and don't have the energy they need and they don't have the focus ability. So carbs, if anything, should be used at night or consumed at night when they make us sleepy, which makes sense. And snacks after school, again, essential, especially if the kid is hungry, many of them are, and we wanna make sure that that protein or that snack also has protein. So let's talk a little bit about exercise. So exercise is great for a couple of things. It definitely helps us fall asleep. If we are physically tired, it is simply easier to drift off. I'm sure most of us have had that experience where mentally we're exhausted, but physically our bodies are still wide awake and it makes it difficult to fall asleep. Exercise also burns off cortisol and adrenaline, which builds up in our bodies throughout the day, especially for people who have anxiety. It builds up and it's very difficult to expel. It's not difficult, it just takes time. Exercise helps expel it more quickly. Exercise also pumps up our serotonin, our endorphin level, so that we actually feel calmer. And again, that can help us focus. It can also help us fall asleep. So the best time for sleep uh, is to exercise two hours before bedtime. No sooner because we're st it uh, also increases our oxygen, so it tends to make us alert. And to that point, if we're exercising for alertness to get all of the adrenaline and cortisol out of our system and to increase our oxygen blood level, then about 15 minutes prior to sitting down to do homework is a good time for us to be exercising. 
and fun. It's really important to make sure that your kid has ample time just to be a kid and to have fun. And it's really important for us as parents not to accidentally train our kids to believe that school is boring, it's tedious, it's dreary, it's painful because those are lessons that they'll carry for the rest of their lives and they will not return to school or they will not enjoy learning as adults and that's not where we want them. So lighten up, don't expect perfection. Their job right now is to learn not to be perfect. Expect passing grades, but beyond that, really it's up to the kid to perform at higher levels if they want to. Find the teaching moments throughout life to help your child find the relevance in what they're studying. And the point of high school and then later college is learning and learning how to learn, not graduation. So it's a process, not an event, and that's really important to keep in mind. And don't overlook the social opportunities in your child's life, whether it's clubs or theater, or robotics, whatever. Make sure that your teen has at least two social activities every week with a friend or with a group of friends, a structured activity, or just hanging out. That is really, really important. And this does not include hanging out with family. That's a different thing. This is outside of the family to connect with the community. It's also important not to ever schedule your child. These kids, uh, kids who have a learning disability, ADHD or Asperger's, need more time than the average neurotypical kid to regroup. And that does include time just to play video games and to surf the internet or watch TV. That's okay as long as it's done within reason. And we like to see every student only have one extracurricular at a time. And what I mean by that is a sport or a club that meets several times a week like debate. If they're trying to do more than that, they're likely overstructured um, and overscheduled. And it also means they won't have enough time just to process and just to relax. It is not a good thing to overstructure kids. It stresses them out and it doesn't teach them how to manage their time. In terms of family, I like family activities at least once a week. Homework doesn't count, I always like to say. Uh, and cleaning house doesn't count either. It's gotta be fun for them and to the extent possible, I really want them to tell you what they wanna do as a family. And if you can, do it with them. These are important things. So even if it's you know sitting down and playing video games with your kids on Friday night and having pizza, Perfect, that's what they wanna do. That's how you can connect with them, that's important. If you can, eat a couple of meals a week with your children. I know many families don't have time to do dinner together. If you can even do it once or twice a week, that's better than nothing. Maybe you have a big Sunday brunch that you all help cook together and then clean up, but it is important to sit down at the table with your kids and really connect with them. And whatever you do, try not to be their therapist, their tutor, their college coach, their taskmaster. You have to be a parent most of the time. If your child needs these uh, specialized services, that's fine. Reach out to the school, reach out to your community. If you have the financial resources, you can hire this out. But I really don't want you to be over-involved with your child's life. This is the time for them to figure it out and to seek out advice with other adults that are in the community. That really helps to raise a well-rounded kid. Alrighty, so here we are now thinking about getting organized for school. So a couple things first. We're developing habits for a lifetime and there are no quick fixes to this. Habits take time to develop, they take effort, and they take repetition to become a habit. And remember, it's harder to start a new habit than to break an old habit. So give yourself and your teen or your young adult some slack. This really does take some time and it takes consistency to really get into place. So we're gonna think in domains here, which is sort of how I divide this up. So I like to think about the different domains as time, when you're gonna do things, space, where things are in the real world, and virtual. This is where things are in the virtual world, which increasingly our children will have to uh, deal with. And we need to figure out a way to integrate all these into a whole. So before we get started with that, additional challenges. In my opinion, there are too many different ways to do every task. Every teacher, for example, has a different system. I know for me as a parent, it really annoys me where one teacher has homework on the internet, another one hands out a slip of paper every week. 
Um, it's just more stuff for our kids to keep track of, and especially if they already have impaired executive functioning skills, this just makes it worse. So you may want to talk to your school about having some consistency between classes, which really is in benefit and in service of the child. I also believe that there's probably too much homework in general, and certainly there's too much homework for most kids to do at a time of day when their attention and their physical ability, if you will, is at its lowest, which is right after school. And I believe that expectations are way too high across the board. I think that we are pushing kids way too hard academically, and it's jeopardizing a well-rounded kid at the end of the day. I did a quick study a few years ago and found out that in my area here in the South Bay of the San Francisco Bay Area, that AP high school students on average had more homework per night than a freshman Stanford student. That was really pretty eye-opening. So first, when we're talking about time, how much? How much time does your student have on average throughout the week? So I would actually spend some time and teach your child how to do this to figure out how much time they're spending on homework then can you look at it? Can we average it out? So for example, some teachers might hand out homework on Monday, others on Wednesday. Let's figure out how the homework flows through the week. What are the best times to do it based on extracurricular activities and what's happening in the family? When is your homework getting done? Remember, students are exhausted oftentimes when they come home from school because they've been sitting still and learning for six straight hours. They're tired, they're hungry, and they're still processing all the information. Not to mention all the social processing and all the social information that's been thrown at them throughout the day. So they really do need a break. It's really difficult for kids to sit right down and crack the books and keep at it until they're done. So sometimes it's a better idea to do that homework after dinner or later in the afternoon. And planning. Does your student have a way to look forward through the week and into the future week? So one problem that I see a lot of, especially with kids who have ADHD, is they only can really tell you about the homework that's due tomorrow. They will forget, and they may not have even written down, the homework that's due next week or in two weeks. So we need to reinforce that, have kids constantly looking forward to what's happening first, second, and third, so that they can start looking out through time, if you will, to figure out what's coming next so that they can plan for it. So now, in my opinion, is the time to start introducing electronic calendars. Most people as adults in today's world are going to be using the calendar on their cell phone or they're gonna be using a calendar on their laptop. Most adults I know no longer use paper-based calendars and very few adolescents prefer them over electronic calendars. Ironically, most high schools and middle schools still hand out the paper calendars. To me, that's a waste of money. I really think we should be teaching kids how to use the tools they're going to be using as adults, and that will be an electronic calendar. So set up a Google Calendar for your student. Set up a family calendar as well, and teach your child how to put schedules, project dates, vacations, extracurriculars, birthdays, etc., and so forth, on that Google Calendar and show them how to sync it to their cell phone. Teach them how to use different colors for different types of activities. Use blue for history tests, use pink for all of the birthdays, however they wanna do it. Make sure that it's up to date and that they get into that habit of checking their calendar every day, of adding things to it. Also, it's another good way for students to actually keep track of upcoming assignments in each class. They can pull out their phone and if they have the time, they can use the calendar to add in the date for the upcoming midterm. Alternately, if they don't have time, and a lot of students won't, they can take a snapshot of the homework assignments on the board. And then when they get home and they have a little bit more time, they can manually transfer the information from the picture they took to their calendar. So another thing we wanna do with regards to time is we wanna teach your teenager or your young adult how to check their own energy and attentional levels. We're gonna do this first by asking them, but we want them to also realize that they need to learn how to check in with themselves. And if they're exhausted, let's let them rest 
Let's let them have some something to eat, something cold to drink, preferably no electronics if we can keep them away from it. And we need to set an alarm that they get one hour, 90 minutes, something like that. And when that timer goes off, they're to get up and get back to work or get to work. Have your teen sit at the desk or a table. Review homework with him or her that's due tomorrow. So we're gonna do some prioritization here. Help your teen estimate how long each assignment's going to take. Is this a 15 minute assignment or is this two hours? Really help them understand what the workload looks like, not just jump in and start slogging through it. Have them really understand how this works. Then I like to have kids set their uh, alarm on their cell phone for 30 to 45 minutes after they've started their homework. I want them at that time to again check their attentional level. Are they exhausted? Do they need a break? Do they need to get up? Do they need to go to the bathroom? Let them take a break. If they're going to take a real break rather than just running to get a glass of water or some such, have them set their alarm on their phone for 10 minutes. When that alarm goes off, they're to go back and sit down and try again and continue for another 30 minutes to 45 minutes. So breaks. So when we're taking a break, we want to make sure that the kid is refueling. So one of the things we want is, again, as I mentioned, food, preferably protein. Maybe they're going to have some chicken salad. Maybe they're going to have a handful of nuts. Cold drinks are great. They wake up the system. A little bit of light exercise, like walking the dog. This is a great time to get that dog walking in or jumping on the trampoline. Both of those are great. They expel adrenaline from the blood system and they increase the endorphins. If the teen is really exhausted, and sometimes they just will be, then let them sleep in the form of a nap of 60 to 90 minutes and make sure they set at least one alarm to wake up. And try to get the teen up and out of bed no later than 5 p.m., otherwise it may interrupt their night sleep. Remember that no one can focus when they're horribly exhausted or drained. It is not good, and kids are often just exhausted when they get home. It sets up a terrible cycle where a task that really should only take 30 minutes ends up taking 90 minutes because they are just exhausted. And it really teaches them to hate school and loathe homework. We really want to make sure that they're in the right place to sit down and power through the homework quickly and effectively. Now, once a week, what I'd recommend is, and preferably on a Sunday, is sit down with the family and go through what is happening on everybody's calendar. So this is when you bring up that you're going to be out of town for a couple of days and dad's going to be doing dinner or you know so and so has a play uh, you know rehearsals so we want everyone in the family to know what everybody else is doing this really models the behavior for your teens but it also helps you kind of pre-think through any snafus like oh my gosh i'm going to have the car all day how are you going to borrow it to get to your judo so you can work through those things in advance rather than kind of living a crisis driven life I also want your kids to plan out what their work week looks like. I think that's really important so that they can see, oh gosh, you know, I'm going to have to do my chores earlier in the day or earlier in the week because I'm going to be busy on Tuesday and Wednesday. That's really good modeling for them and it's good for the whole family, as I say, to kind of keep everything moving. So another thing that's interesting about working with neurodiverse kids is they tend to have no sense in their bodies of passage of time. So they can't tell you how long they've been sitting and doing a specific task. Either it seems like it was three seconds when in fact it was an hour or it feels like it's been an hour and it's only been a minute. This is something that they can learn over time, but you have to really help them learn it. So we have to help them by teaching them how to parcel out time and how to manage it. We're also overburdened by time just as a society. We need to help everyone in our family understand how the week's going to progress, again, to avoid the surprises. It's a valuable resource, and I want teens to know it's valuable, and it's valuable not just for the work that we produce, but also for the human connections and for the time we spend with ourselves. So it doesn't mean by saying that time is valuable that every minute has to be filled. In fact, it shouldn't be. There should be plenty of time that there is to do nothing. And we have to teach our kids and model to them that they really cannot do it all. And so you have to have them see you turn down social invitations 
or struggle with with workload at your own place of employment. It's important that they see that they're not alone, that these things happen to everybody and that there are times when you have to make a compromise. So let's move on to space now. Neurodiverse kids also have a hard time with space. And if you have one of these kids, you know that they lose their keys, they lose their cell phones. Oftentimes their bedrooms look like disasters and that's okay, that's sort of how they roll. Uh, they can also be distracted by their space though. So this is not necessarily a good group of kids to tell to go do their homework in their room. Frequently they do a little bit better job if they're doing their homework in a fairly quiet place, but one that's more centrally located like the kitchen or the dining room. Let's make sure that everything they need is in one place. I do not want them scrambling, looking for extra paper or finding a sharp pencil, etc. So wherever they're going to do their work, that's their workspace. They should have everything they need right there. And it should be more or less clean. Uh, we don't have to be slavish about it, but again, it shouldn't look like a pigsty. Make sure that they're cleaning up their workspace at least once a week, sorting stuff, throwing stuff out they don't need, finding that homework assignment they meant to turn in and didn't get to, uh, and that kind of thing. So they need to be cleaning it. And rather than tell your child, I need you to clean it up, that may not be enough direction. Kids need concrete, they need specific. So you may need to say, I need you to sort through and throw away all the stuff you don't need and file all the stuff you wanna keep in the appropriate folder. Give them more direction, you're gonna have a better result. Do the same with backpacks. If you can find them, and you can usually get them online, I really like the standing backpack file folders rather than the lateral type of file folders. These sit in a backpack, you can open them on the top rather than on the sides. Uh, I like to get two for each class. One is the to-do, that's the homework coming home, and one is the turn in, so that's the homework going back in. And I like to color code them, so I like, if at all possible, to have a set of materials, for example, for history. So the spiral bound notebook and the actual three ring binder and the folders are all blue, for example. This color coding makes it much easier for the kid to uh, sort through information, sort through their backpack much more quickly. They always look for the blue, they're sitting in second period, this kind of thing. Really helps with time saving. Also, be prepared to sit down with your teen and clean out the backpack at least once a week, just like the desktop. And again, you're gonna look for missing homework, you're gonna look for uh, anything, any of those permission slips that need to be signed, that type of thing. Sort through it, take care of it once a week. If your teen has a locker, you may need to go to school once a week, if at all possible, and help him or her sort out their locker. Good idea to bring a garbage bag for obvious reasons. The important thing is don't expect perfection here. Um, things are gonna get lost, things are gonna get misplaced. As long as it's not a crisis every single day, that's okay. Get the homework turned in as possible. You know, Get the replacement assignments as needed. If the school is really over the top on this, then push back to them if they start getting unruly about perfectionism. So let's talk about virtual space. So this is our laptop, our computers. This is where we turn homework in online, websites and so forth. More and more teachers are using online uh, resources, websites, drop boxes, this kind of thing. And in fact, by the time your child goes to college, he or she is going to college, almost every homework assignment now is turned in electronically. So get them into the habit now. Help your child to understand how to virtually organize that life. Do it now so that when they do go to college, they know how to do it. Check his or her computer every few weeks. So how do we do this? First off, check to make sure that the bookmarks that they need are on their IE or Firefox or whatever they're using, or that all of those websites auto load every time they start their browser. And that's fairly easy to do. If there's a lot of different uh, bookmarks, help your child organize them into folders. Then on the computer desktop, we're gonna have one folder called school. Just call it school or schoolwork. And under that, there should be a separate folder for each class. So one for history, one for English. And then all of the papers and electronic files should be stored in those individual files. Again, you may need to sit down once a week and help your child sort everything in there. If the student's using Google Docs, that's fine. They can set up the same type of file structure on Google Docs. But again, we want it ordered, we want them labeled. 
At the end of each term, the student should take that folder called schoolwork and they should grab that whole thing and call it term X, right? So they should call it, you know, first trimester 2014 and they should set up a new folder called schoolwork and do the same thing at the end of that trimester or that semester or term. That's a really good way for them to keep track of all their previous information if they need it, but it also starts afresh every trimester or every term so they're not slogging through a whole bunch of files looking for stuff. Some other things that you can do in the virtual level is you can purchase a live scribe pen which both does audio recording and records whatever is written on paper. This is especially good for kids who have auditory processing disorder or poor handwriting or just take longer to write so that they are actually capturing the audio of the lecture as well as whatever they're writing down. Then all of that can be uploaded into your child's computer and they can store it in OneNote or Evernote with all of the other documents and files for that class so that they have a complete picture of everything needed in that class. On that same note, I would strongly recommend to start backing up your child's laptop, certainly all of their schoolwork, and just plan on buying a license over a period of time. Of course, all uh, documents on a, a computer should be backed up off-site. There are lots of different programs out there that aren't terribly expensive that automatically back up data from one or more file folders on your computer automatically off-site. You don't have to do anything, it just happens in the background. I Just like many families have AAA for their kids' cars, I believe that it's very important to have backup service for my kids' computers. I just think it's something that you know doesn't cost much and can really save a crisis down the road. So one other thing that we didn't talk too much about but I think is important too, and that is teaching your kids how to prioritize. Prioritization is really a skill that comes frequently once you're enter entering the workplace, but I really think that it's an important skill even for kids. And I think the earlier we teach them how to prioritize, the better off they are. There's a lot of different ways to prioritize. I, you know, I'm not a big fan of any particular one, but I think that it's important that they realize that not everything can be done at the same time and completed on time. And that's certainly true in our adult lives as well. So teach them whatever works for you. Teach them what is urgent and important. Try to stay away from the not important but urgent things as possible. And remember that all kids need ample time to do nothing. They really, truly do. And they need time to process what they've learned. So give them downtime. So let's wrap up here. So first off, structure time management, physical organization, breaking down tasks, and prioritizing. All very important. That's the structure that we want to have in place for students to be successful throughout their school year, both in high school and then later in college. Also, it has to be consistent. I know a lot of parents mean well, and they start with great fervor on a program like this. They do it for maybe a week. It doesn't immediately show huge success, and so they give up. Remember, it takes a long time to build a habit, so you really have to stick at it for at least a month, anything in here. It does stick over time, and it will work. Don't wait for a crisis. I always recommend start at the beginning of the school year and work consistently through the school year. Repetition. By repeating the structure over and over again, you're building the skills for later success. So it's not just about high school or college. It's about the working world. It's about being a good partner. It's about having good relationships. All of this is really key to that. When there's conflict, hire an expert if you can. Go to the school, check your community, look for help. If you have the resources, you can always hire somebody. There's plenty of people in every community who can help with this, so don't think you have to do it all on your own. And remember that more adults in your child's life oftentimes is a good thing, especially as they reach maturity, because they're modeling from other adults. It's really important. And finally, expectations. If your expectations are too high, your child may never meet them and they're gonna feel like a failure. Remember that the goal of education is to learn not to be perfect. So let's wrap up. 
these skills are really necessary throughout life to be successful and not learning them is almost certainly going to cause problems down the road. So I would think about these skills as really part and parcel of the academics that they need to learn. They won't be taught many of these skills in school, but they are as important, if not more so, than the actual academic education they're getting in school. They may never need to remember what happened in the Battle of 1812, but they certainly will need to know how to manage their time. And remember, it's never too late to start with working on these skills, but no matter when you start, you will always wish you had started earlier. Thanks very much for listening. This is Jan Johnston Tyler, Evo Libre Consulting.